I can't believe Kieran made us come in today. I clicked my tongue, carelessly brushing my hand over a stack of last week's laptops, nearly sending the top one flying off the counter. As if we have nothing better to do on a Saturday afternoon. Petrov grunted with what I could only assume was agreement, keeping his eyes glued to a scantily clad woman, crossing and uncrossing her legs on the desktop of the latest plum book. I pursed my lips. Weren't plum books supposed to be like virus proof? This looked like a multi parasitic virus, too, with a flash mob of tasteless gifts dancing across the screen. Looks pretty bad, I sighed, nodding in his direction. That one alone will take ages to fix. We'll be stuck here for hours. Petrov went slightly before turning to look at me. A hint of rouge had traveled up his collar and his eyes were darting wildly across my face. The way they always did when our gazes met. I put on my most convincing smile. Petrov was a nice guy, truly. Shy, modest, and a little unorthodox, but kind nonetheless. I've gotten to know him quite a bit since I had started working here last spring. We've gone out for drinks a few times, as friends, during which he let it slip about his love for rock balancing and noodling. My parents own a lake house down south. He said right after he had clarified that noodling wasn't a culinary skill. It's nice there in the summer, maybe you and I could go sometime. When we're not working, that is. That had been my cue to turn red as I racked my brain for a good enough excuse. I wasn't declining because we were co-workers, no. I generally wasn't too bothered about corporate roles. It was just, well, Petrov really wasn't my type. I ended up telling him that my entire summer was already booked up. It was my best attempt at sparing his feelings, which were ruthlessly seeping into his cheeks and even the tips of his ears. I also worried that I had been giving him the wrong idea, so we never went out for drinks after that, coming up with excuse after excuse, until he had finally stopped asking. Perhaps the other ones will be easier, he uttered, clearing his throat twice. Why don't you check the box? I squinted at it, an overwhelming sense of disdain bubbling up in my chest. Lauren and Mildred were no doubt at the spa by now, probably in the process of comparing two identical colors of nail varnish for their pedicures. Probably laughing about how I was stuck at work on the weekend. Probably. I doubt it, I said, slipping off of the swivel chair and making my way towards the box in question. Uh, I bet you ten bucks that at least three of these have keyboard stains. Petrov let out an awkward giggle. You're on. I thumbed through the laptops without particular interest. Some were dense with stickers from video games, others covered in what I could only assume was black sharpie. One of them had vents so crusty that they actually made noise when I managed to pry the lid open. Ah, oh, gross. I tossed it back onto the pile, wiping my hands on my jeans. And to think the people who bring these in look so normal. If I didn't know any better, I would guess they were pulled straight out of the dumpster. I turned to Petrov, my tainted hands outstretched in front of me, but he wasn't listening. In fact, he didn't seem to be looking either. His gaze was transfixed on something over my shoulder. Hello, I sang, waving my disgusting hands in the air in front of him. Earth to Petrov. Without saying anything, he placed his hands over my shoulders and pushed me aside. I flinched at the unexpected touch, but he was so absorbed in whatever he was looking at, I don't even think that he noticed. What are you... I began, bracing myself to face a masked figure on the other side of the counter. Reactions like this were unlike Petrov. He was always so calm and collected. I couldn't help feeling a pang of fear in my stomach. But there was no masked man, no grizzly bear coyote or catfish. I mean he said that he was into noodling right. Could catfish theoretically evoke this sort of reaction? Relieved that there didn't seem to be any immediate emergency, I snickered at my own joke. 
What are you laughing at? Petrov whispered with his back still to me. He was hunched over the pile of laptops that I had just contracted. Do you know what this is? He lifted the crusty vented laptop for me to see. Uh, a revolting vessel of dried fluids. I cocked my head to the side as though I was appraising a painting, before adding, 3,000? He sniffed, brushing my joke away into oblivion, and tapped against the aluminum finish. Look at the logo, Jenny. I squinted at it, trying my best to ignore the crispy bits sticking out of the back vents. S. S. E. Essence, Petrov's eyes were wide and gleaming. He looked like a child during Christmas. It's an Essence laptop. I snorted. Well, that sounds about right, all things considered. But Petrov shook his head. Do you know how old this is? Essence went bankrupt in 95. I pursed my lips, trying my best not to laugh. I wonder why. Clearly unfazed by my sarcasm, Petrov flipped the lid open and started mashing the power button. I haven't seen one of these in 15 years. I figured the last ones would be in a museum by now. I'm surprised if it still works. I watched as the screen gradually came to life. Pixel by pixel loaded up the cartoony desktop icons, a calculator app, a drab looking media player, a notepad and a folder named GPH. Hey, those are my initials, I pointed at the folder, my acrylic nail making a rainbow indent on the screen. Jenny P. Hopkins, he nodded, or it could also mean gallons per hour, generalized proportional hazard, gestational proteinuric hypertension. Ah, just open it, I scoffed. Petrov could be such a smarty sometimes. Let's see what it is. Jenny, you know that we can't do that. He protested, typing control panel into the search bar. Let me just figure out what the issue is. I'm not sure that we even have the means to fix something like this. Do you know who brought it in? I shook my head. I and the rest of the laptop strewn across the counter. I thought you knew. I wasn't here for half of these. That must have been Kieran then. Hey, see if there's a phone number or something in the... He trailed off. What? What is it? I crouched down beside him, trying to figure out what we were looking at. Is it the folder? The last part was meant to be a joke, but Petrov's expression remained grim. It might as well be, he said to my surprise. There's nothing else on this laptop. I raised my eyebrow. What do you mean there's nothing else on it? As in no other files? He shook his head. There's nothing on it. No control panel, no applications. An empty drive. But what about all these? I tapped the screen where the notepad calculator and media player were nestled. I mean, they're apps, aren't they? Petrov didn't respond. Instead, scooping up my hand in his and placing it on top of the mouse. See for yourself. I swallowed, directing the cursor toward the calculator icon. Double click, nothing. I tried again, this time with the media player, clicking and dragging the cursor until the vein of my thumb bulged. Maybe it's just frozen, I suggested. In a way, Petrov agreed. And then before I could find the delete key, added, It's a wallpaper. I gawked at him. A wallpaper? Look, he said gently reclaiming the mouse. I can't move or click anything besides the folder. Once he said it, I could clearly see that the icons looked slightly washed out. But I had thought that it was just because of the 25-year-old monitor. For the first time in weeks, my curiosity was piqued. A laptop with nothing on it. How was that even possible? You want to do the honors? Petrov asked, giving me a little side smirk. I snatched the mouse and double-clicked the rectangular icon. It flew open at once with a large white window that took up most of the screen. Inside sat a single file with no preview thumbnail. It was named gph.avi. Petrov and I exchanged glances. It's a video. 
I said stupidly. It is, he agreed. Do you want to watch it? I hesitated. Mysterious videos on grubby laptops certainly weren't my favorite. Heck, I never even chanced any videos on social media, always fearing the worst. If it was concealed behind an opaque cover, it probably wasn't for me. What if it's a gold? Something horrifying. Like what? said Petrov, refusing to cooperate. Think about it, Jenny. Why would anybody put anything illegal on a laptop that they needed fixing? It's probably just a video of somebody's family or a wedding or ooh. Maybe it's one of those old pirated movies. Okay, okay, I conceded, not wanting to back out of what was technically my own idea. Just play it. Well, technically I can't. Petrov admitted with dismay. There is no media player, remember? I need to transfer it onto one of our computers. I nodded, watching him fish out a USB stick from one of the drawers. Now this really seemed like a bad idea. A cold chill crawled up my bare arms and I realized that the sky outside was growing dark. It was almost 5 p.m. Only 10 minutes to go until the end of our shift. Maybe I could still catch up to Lauren and Mildred at the spa. Now here it is. Petrov's voice interrupted my thoughts. You ready to play? I chewed my inner lap. I knew that Petrov was only doing this because I had expressed a desire to open the folder, and I couldn't let the principles go now. Besides, what if it was something life-changing, like the location of a treasure, or the answers to a cold murder case? I'm ready, I mumbled, less confidently than intended. For the first few seconds of the video, the screen was black. Maybe it's the format... I began but was immediately cut off by a faint sound of static. A black and white image came into view. Well, it seemed like an image at first. Before I realized, it was the feed from the overhead security camera pointed at the counter. It's security footage from... I choked up. From the store? I felt Petrov tensing up beside me. What the heck was going on? I could tell the video was playing by the horizontal lines dancing across the screen, but there were no people in the shot. The store was completely empty. I squinted at the timestamp at the bottom right of the screen. December 3rd, 2022. Saturday, 1.46. Petrov must have had the same idea because, before I could even open my mouth, he whispered, It's from... yesterday? Last night to be precise, the footage was shrouded in darkness and the digital clock at the bottom indicated that no one had set foot into the store for at least seven hours. What? My mouth was dry. Why would... how can last night's footage be on that laptop? It was supposed to be a question, but Petrov didn't answer. He was leaning forward now, expecting some invisible speck on the screen. What? What is it? I demanded, leaning in closer to see. He pointed to the wall adjacent to the counter. Look at that. I inched closer. What? I don't see it. The vent cover. He paused the video to zoom in. It's on the floor, see? I saw. The large rectangular wall vent that was always such a nuisance when it came to decorating for Christmas. It was now wide open with its cover lying idly on the floor beside it. Maybe Kieran. I began but stopped short. A woman with a short bob and glasses was navigating through the shelves. She moved slowly and awkwardly, her palms outstretched in front of her as though she was sleepwalking. My heard Petrov draw on a whistling breath next to me and my stomach lurched. Is that you? He whispered, his voice laced with something I couldn't tell what. Sweat was pooling under my arms and a lump rising in my throat. No, it's... I croaked. It couldn't be. We watched in stunned silence as the woman made her way to the counter and disappeared into the vent, pulling the grate cover back into place behind her and then the screen went black. 
I, I don't understand. I wailed, turning to face Petrov. That wasn't me. Petrov looked introspective for a moment. But the camera. I don't care about the camera. Last night at 1am I was sleeping in my own bed 10 miles away. And I added, for good measure, I don't sleepwalk. Silence descended upon us again, and I found myself growing restless and uncomfortable. It was exactly 5pm now and time to go home. The sky outside was bluish black and a low rumbling in the distance was foreshadowing rain. But Petrov didn't move. Well, if it wasn't you, he said slowly as if considering every word. Then we must have had an intruder in the store. Or maybe, I suggested. Kieran had hired somebody to. To what? Sleepwalk in her pajamas around the vents at midnight. The corners of his mouth twitched, but his expression remained shrouded. You ever wonder what's down there? Where? In the vents. Plenty of space for a person, maybe even two. It's gotta lead somewhere, right? I didn't even know that you could go in there. What the heck, Petrov? You're freaking me out. Let's just go home. He contemplated for a moment. Maybe just a quick little peek. I stared at him. You wanna go into the vents right now? Yeah, why not? The shift's over, his doors are closed. Might as well do some exploring. I bit my lip. I'm sorry, Petrov. I promised my friends that I would meet them for dinner. Maybe next time, though, okay? I slid off my chair and headed for the locker room when a metallic rattling had stopped me in my tracks. I spun on my heel to find Petrov kneeling in front of the vent cover, meticulously dislodging the corners with his hands. He set it down on the floor with a faint clatter. What are you doing? He turned to look at me, a playful smirk on his face. Well, if you won't join me, I guess I'll have to go alone. And with that, he disappeared into the vent. The aluminum flooring creaked and groaned in protest as I crawled through the vent. It felt as if I were traveling through a portal to a new realm. And maybe I was. The path was impossibly dark. I slipped my pen light from my belt and I clicked it on. I expected to see the tunnel end at some point, but it didn't. Not before the light was swallowed up by the abysmal darkness at least. Suddenly, it didn't feel like the fun adventure that I had thought it would be. An uneasy twinge was slowly swirling my stomach. Be careful. I heard Ginny holler from somewhere distant, back at the store. I didn't bother responding. For some reason, I felt like if I did, something deep within these walls would know that I was here, and I didn't want to alert it to my presence. Besides, it's not like Ginny cared for me. Well, not in that way anyway. I knew that I wasn't delusional. But I couldn't stop how I felt about her. And that was the worst part. Crap, I should be at the end by now. I had traveled a few hundred feet at least. Logic would say that I would be in the rear parking lot by now. This didn't make any sense at all. Just as I was starting to flirt with the idea of somehow spinning around and making my way back... It felt like the floor had been taken out from under me. My guts launched up into my throat as I dropped several feet before sprawling across beige carpet. What the heck? I muttered as I struggled to my feet. Wow. I stood awestruck with my mouth agape. I couldn't even comprehend what this place was. This room. It was enormous like a parking garage but every single surface except for the can lights were covered in beige carpet. Carpeted beams lurched upwards to a 15 foot tall ceiling. It was warm and cozy, but so very empty and vast. How was this possible? Where was I? Somewhere below the store, underground. I had so many questions, but not even an inkling to a rational explanation. Just wait until I tell Jenny about this. I was about to head back up the vent tunnel when I spotted a blue door on the other side of the carpeted room. 
was not there before. It must do have been, but I hadn't seen it just a moment ago. Curiosity got the best of me. Snags of frayed threads grabbed the soles of my sneakers as I made my way to the door. The handle was brass and cool to the touch. I half expected it to be locked, but it twisted freely and the door opened with a groan. Another room. One with about two inches of standing water. It quickly started to rush in and permeate the carpet. I jumped through the threshold and slammed the door to stop the leak. I felt the water soaking through my shoes immediately and saturate my socks. Ugh. The walls were covered in white subway tile. The fluorescent lights danced across the pale blue water. More pearled porcelain lay underneath. Weird, I whispered. This room was much smaller, almost like a connecting room you would see at a doctor's office. A red door rested in a maroon frame not ten feet to the other side. The ceiling was so low that I could feel the hair on the top of my head graze against the grout joints as I made my way across. I placed my hand on the brass knob and I nearly recoiled. It was so warm, as if flames flickered on the other side. A silent prayer that it wasn't a fire lay on my lips as I slowly pried it open. I sighed in relief. There was no inferno. But the relief quickly died somewhere in my chest. The eeriness of the hallway that lay before me caused the hair on the back of my neck to stand up. Goose flesh broke out across my arms. Lockers lined both sides of the hall as the fluorescent lights flickered above. A red emergency light spun a strobing pattern halfway down just before the light had ended. The darkness at the end of the hall seemed overwhelming. Something was there, I could feel it. Whispers crept into my ears. They weren't discernible, almost like chatter from a crowd. Too many voices to make any single one out. A low vibration growled across the floor, sending a tremor up through my knees. Just as I felt a scream bubble up into my throat, I felt someone grab my hand and pull me back through the door into the water room. I could hear the red door slam behind me as I almost went face first into the tiled water. I spun around with a fist raised over my head, ready to sock whoever it was in self-defense. Ginny, I gasped, lowering my arm. Why were you gone for so long? She asked. What are you doing down here? I came looking for you after a while. I'm just so glad that you're okay. She wrapped her arms around me in a gentle embrace. I went stiff as a board at the unexpected touch. She had never hugged me before. But as she nestled her face into my collarbone, I melted like butter. A small ache began to throb in my heart. Um, well yeah, it's okay. I'm fine. I was so worried. Her breath was hot on my neck, sending a tingle up my spine. It's okay, really. I dared to run my hand through her short hair. My stomach did somersaults when she didn't smack it away. Let's go home, she whispered, standing back for me. Her eyes were different. They were full of warmth. She laced her fingers in mine and pulled me towards the blue door. Okay. My mind was blown. The affection was even more strange than the entire existence of these back rooms. As she opened the door, the water began to rush under the carpet like before. She giggled as she pushed me through the opening and shut the door behind us. Oh, what has gotten into you, Jenny? I chuckled. What do you mean? She bit her lower lip playfully. You're never like this with, with me, you know. Well, I want to be. You do? Yes. She uttered softly, grabbing my chin between her thumb and index finger. My heart thundered in my chest like a rabbit thrashing against its cage. She gazed deeply into my eyes and then pulled me into a kiss. Her lips were soft and warm. They were everything that I had imagined them to be. Her tongue slipped behind my teeth and danced with mine. 
An urge stirred beneath my jeans as I felt her hands fumble at my waist. Just as I became lost in her, the light suddenly went out. Everything went black. I tried to grab Ginny, but I felt her slip away. I fumbled a few feet into the darkness, trying to find her, but my hands swiped the air fruitlessly. Ginny, where are you? I shouted. The lights flickered back on. I spun around and she was nowhere to be seen. The sea of beige carpet stretched out in the expanse before me, but no Ginny. A thumping. It sounded like someone was traveling through the vent at the edge of the room, the one that led back to the store. She must have gotten freaked out when the lights went out and booked it back to the tunnel. I sprinted over to the opening. Ginny, wait for me. I clambered up through the vertical section and pulled myself through until I was on my hands and knees once again. Jenny, I called but to no reply. I fumbled through the tunnel as fast as I could. Pain radiated from deep within my kneecaps but I pressed on. After a few minutes I could see the light of the store shine through the darkness. I went even faster, half afraid and half dying to be back in her arms. Even through the absolute insanity of the back rooms, all I could think about was her. It was finally our time. I spilled out into the store. Ginny, I hollered. Petrov, what's going on? I gasped as he came flying out of the vent, nearly knocking down a nearby shelf of Bluetooth accessories. Are you alright? He certainly didn't look alright. His blonde hair was disheveled and his forehead was slick with sweat. Why was he running? I'm fine, I'm fine, Petrov panted. Are you okay? Why did you run off like that? Did you see something? I raised my eyebrow at the barrage of questions. What are you talking about? I just went to the locker room to get my stuff. I raised the umbrella that I was clutching to illustrate my point. What was his problem? But he stared at me as though I was the crazy one. No, before that, in the carpet room. What carpet room, Petrov? What did you find in there? He was trembling. Although the temperature in the store was about 78 degrees. It doesn't matter. I'm just happy that. He reached out and cut my hand in his, pulling my body towards them. My stomach lurched as I remembered that I had left my pepper spray in my jogging jersey this morning. What the heck are you doing? I demanded, in the most self-assured tone that I could muster. Hesitation flashed in his eyes and I took the opportunity to snatch my hand away. But, he stuttered, but what about our kiss? On second thought, perhaps pepper spray wouldn't have been enough anyway. Petrov had obviously gone crazy. Petrov, I began, taking a deep breath in hopes that it would alleviate the lump of disdain rising in my throat. Sit down. Let's talk about this. As he perched on one of these swivel chairs at the counter, I fumbled in my handbag pulling out a worn out looking water bottle. He shook his head at it. Why are you doing this, Jenny? I promise that I won't be upset if you just tell me why you ran away. If it got too much for you, I understand. We can take it slow. Just please. Petrov made a defeated gesture with his hands. I leaned on the countertop, wondering if he had really lost it. Perhaps calling the authorities wouldn't be the worst idea. I mean who? Can you tell me the truth? What truth, Petrov? I'll be honest, you sound. I bit my tongue before I could say the word crazy, not wanting to provoke him. I mean, who knew what he was capable of in the state? You sound hurt. Now I'm sorry if I said or did anything to cause that. It wasn't my intention. Then why did you run from me? He persisted, wiping the sweat poking out above his upper lip. In the carpet room. Uh, not again with the carpet room. Petrov, I never went into any carpet room. When you entered the vent, I went to the locker room to get my stuff. And then you came out five minutes later looking like this. Now, I don't know what... You didn't. He swallowed, his eyes darting across the room. 
follow me. No, I cried with a little too much enthusiasm. His face fell, so I quickly added, I was just in a hurry to meet my friends. But then, his expression shifted from dismay to alarm. Who was with me in the... He jumped up from his chair and charged towards the computer before I could stop him. When I circled the counter and joined him, he was already clacking away furiously at the keyboard. What, what are you doing? I asked carefully. He grunted as though it couldn't have been more obvious. Rewinding the camera. I glanced at it. It was the same camera that we had watched the footage from only a half hour earlier. It was the same camera that was pointed directly at the gaping vent. Uh, maybe, I suggested. Maybe if you go home and get some rest. To say that Petrov was a hard worker would be a severe understatement. He always came to work before anyone else, and he refused to leave until everything in the store was picture perfect. He took on every additional shift and responsibility, and he took great pride in his career. Okay, so this is where I enter the vent. He mumbled under his breath as his words were illustrated on the monitor. I jabbed at the screen. And this is where I walked towards the locker room, see? My camera counterpart rolled her eyes as she turned away from the vent. I prayed that Petrov wouldn't notice. We sat in silence as the video footage played back to us. The seconds on the timestamp ticking by painfully slowly. Maybe if you fast. No. Petrov's tone was suddenly irate. As soon as we start meddling or interfering in any way, the authenticity is lost. I need to see the whole thing as is. I didn't dare say anything after that. Not even when I appeared on the screen once more five minutes later. Carrying my handbag in my right hand and an umbrella in my left. Okay, here we go. Petrov clenched his fist, leaving a pattern of perspiration on the surface of the computer mouse. It's a moment of truth. I pursed my lips, suddenly dreading his reaction when he found out that I wasn't lying. Petrov must have felt it too, because his shoulders tensed up and a shadow of a vein bulged in his neck. Look, I began, Try my best to think of a way to amend the situation. When a panic-stricken Petrov spilled out of the vent on camera, as though the devil himself was chasing him. Jenny, he called. Petrov, what's going on? The image of me rushed over to meet him. I diverted my eyes from the monitor to glance at Petrov. He was studying the screen, a droplet of sweat trickling down his right temple. His knuckles were white and his fingernails were digging into his palms. Listen, I said trying to distract him. How about I ditch my friends and we go out for drinks again? Just you and me. I flinched at how unnatural my tone sounded, but I couldn't just leave him there. I knew if I did that he would spend hours analyzing the same five minutes of tape over and over, zooming in and out, looking for invisible dots or ghost orbs or whatever it was that he was expecting to see. I was hoping that he would jump at the opportunity, but he didn't even look at me. Jenny, he said, his voice an indistinct mumble. You don't understand what I saw in that vent. Well, let's go in and then you can show me, I interrupted. I was certain that whatever it was, it was simply the product of Petrov's wary mind in solitude. It wouldn't happen again, I was sure of it. He turned to face me, his eyes wide. We can't do that. Why not? I almost wanted to laugh but felt like that'd be disrespectful. For a moment, he looked like he was grappling with thought. Because, because, I wouldn't put you in danger like that, Jenny. The agitation in his eyes melted away, and for a moment I got a glimpse of tenderness in his gaze. It sent a shiver down my spine, which I shook off quickly. I needed to get out of here before it, whatever it was, got to me too. It was Petrov, for God's sake. Okay, well, then how about those drinks? I clasped my hands with an audible pop, hoping that it would snap me out of this new feeling that I didn't care for. Shall we go? We can talk more about it on the way. Petrov sighed. 
It was blatantly obvious that he wanted to go, but he was conflicted in his priorities. The video now depicted us talking over the counter facing one another. I proved my point. Let me just turn this off, he said, unclenching his fists and reaching for the mouse. Can you close up the vent? But before I could even take a single step, the video feed stopped me in my tracks. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Petrov was frozen too. Something was making its way out of the open vent. We had been talking too much at the counter to notice it. It was alien, with sharp-looking limbs and long fingers, reaching all the way down to its knees. Its skin was white and almost translucent, and its bald head far too small to be human. It slipped through the opening in a quick and effortless motion, almost as though it were gliding through air, and it disappeared behind a row of shelves, just as I had circled the counter to join Petrov at the computer. And then the video cut out. We stared at the blank screen in silence. My heart was thundering in my chest and my eyes kept darting across the room to the shelves adjacent to the vent. There was no way, no way this could be happening to me, to us. For the first time in my life, I clutched Petrov's hand. Five minutes ago, I would have given anything to have Ginny's hand in mine again, but now I hardly noticed it. Fear crept up the nape of my neck and choked off all higher brain function. Flight was all that was left. Door, now, run. It was all that I could muster as I yanked Ginny in the direction of the storefront. Petrov, slow down. I heard a yell behind me, but I couldn't. My legs bound like a deer for the exit. Her footfall smacked loudly behind me, desperate to keep up. Just as we had rounded the corner to the double doors, I felt her palm rip away from my own. A scream cut through the store as I hit the brakes on my heels. I tried to spin around too fast and my body slipped out over my knees and I landed harshly on my shoulder. I looked up just in time to catch a glimpse of it carrying Ginny off in the other direction. No, stop. I screeched, scrambling back to my feet. I chased after them, but it was so fast. I had never seen anything move like it before. She seemed to be weightless in its arms. As I rounded the shelves, I got one glimpse of the terror on Ginny's face as she was sucked into the vent with the creature. A silent scream plastered among a tapestry of freckles. Ginny, I cried, but it was too late. She was gone. I leapt through the vent after them. My mind was numb with static as I pounded my hands and knees through the aluminum portal to the back rooms. Only after I had felt like I had been traveling entirely too long did I reach the pitfall. My stomach flipped in my abdomen as I fell to the ground. The air was knocked from my lungs as I clashed against the stone floor. I gasped for breath as I rolled to my side. This wasn't the carpet room. What the heck? I was on a platform that was made from a stone slab. It floated amongst other slabs inside of a large bog. The water was a greenish hue and clumps of moss floated by lazily in a gentle current. I looked up to ensure the vent was above me. The metal opening hung in the sky and disappeared into a fog just above it. How was this possible? A slamming sound pulled me from my wonderment. A golden door lay six slabs away, its frame somehow suspended in the fog. Ginny! I shouted as I quickly leapt from one slab to the other, but careful enough not to slip into the murky waters below. I grabbed a hold of the golden knob and threw the door open outward. Water rushed around my feet in a stream. The room was a huge bathroom, one that you would see in an airport but about a hundred times larger. I hopped through the threshold but didn't bother closing the door. What the heck is with the water? I grumbled. It was almost up to my calf. Row after row of stalls lined the walls. The partition hung open where I could see the toilets were overflowing. The very last stall on the left wasn't a stall at all, but a green door. I thrashed through the water. This door had an inward swing 
causing the water to throw it open, smacking it against the adjacent wall. I spilled through into the next room and struggled to close it. It took all of my strength to push it back into the frame until the latch had clicked. Petrov? I spun around. Ginny. My mouth fell open. There were two of them identical. Oh my god, Petrov. One of them ran to me and wrapped her arms around me. Instinctively, I almost pulled her in closer, but I pushed her away instead. What the heck is going on? I motioned my hand back and forth between them. She's not me. I'm the real Ginny. The one that had embraced me pleaded with eyes full of tears. Petrov, listen, she is not the real Ginny. I woke up in this church after that thing brought me through the vent. The other Ginny put up her hands to show innocence. She's a liar. It's me. I woke up in here. The other cried. Okay, both of you shut it for a second. I need to think. I took a moment to look around for the first time since I had entered the room. It was a large cathedral with rows of pews and stained glass windows. A shudder traveled down my spine at the reminiscence of a Catholic school. I looked back at the two of them. They both seemed genuinely grim with fear. Listen, Petrov. The one that hugged me before now reached out for my hand. She laced her fingers in mine and gazed up at me with pleading eyes. This one is very touchy, I thought. Ginny had never been that way. Not towards me, not until, well, the carpet roam. I pulled my hand away. Petrov. Her lips trembled. I looked at the other Ginny and held out my hand. She took it after brief hesitation. This had to be her. Let's go. I whispered to my Ginny. A tear cascaded down her cheek as she nodded her head in agreement. Petrov, don't. I'm the real Ginny. The other begged. You don't follow us, do you hear me? If you do, I'll kill you. I swear that I will. And I meant it. Petrov. She mouthed, reaching out for me again. I knocked her hand away. Don't follow us. I yanked Ginny towards the door and flung it open. Water rushed in as before and we had to press our bodies against the frame to fart our way into the overgrown restroom. The water was so much higher now, up to our ways. There was no closing the door. We waded through the depths as fast as we possibly could. I glanced over my shoulder every few seconds to make sure the other Ginny wasn't following. The tension in my shoulder should have released after I saw that she wasn't, time and time again. Once we got to the golden frame, I saw that the gentle current of the bog was now like a roaring river. One misstep and we'd be swept away. Petrov, I'm scared. Jenny's fingers tightened around my own. Me too, but it'll be okay. Just jump and I jump, okay? I reassured her. She shook her head in agreement. We timed out the jumps perfectly from slab to slab. Careful not to plunge into the certain death of the stream. Okay, you go up first. I'll give you a boost. She nodded again as I grabbed her waist to help her hop into the vent. I pushed onto the soles of her shoes to help her clear into the horizontal portion of the tunnel. I looked back once more. The other one hadn't followed. I let out a sigh of relief and pulled myself through the opening. After a few minutes, we were back in the store. Ginny helped me pull the nearest shelf over to the vent to barricade the portal. Once we were safe, she broke down in tears and heaving sobs. I wrapped my arms around her and she didn't pull away. She melted against me, weeping into my chest. It's okay, it's okay. I ran my hand over her wet hair. Exhaustion seeped through every bone in my body. Petrov, she whispered. Yes? Thank you. She pulled back. Her eyes were bloodshot from the tears, but she leaned up and kissed my cheek. Can I stay with you tonight? Uh, yeah, of course, I stammered. I just don't want to be alone after everything. Sure, yeah, that would be great. We started to walk out of the store before Jenny stopped at the help desk. She grabbed a pen and started furiously scribbling out a note. 
When she was done, she held it up to me. Karen, it's been real but Petrov and I quit. Sorry. Jenny, I held out a thumbs up and chuckled weakly. We made our way to the parking lot. Jenny pulled herself close to me and I just figured she was shook up from everything. I mean, I was too. Once we were to the car, she paused and turned to me. Her eyes searched mine and I felt my heart skip a beat. She kissed me. She kissed me long and hard. Let's go home, she smiled. I opened the door to my Volkswagen and helped her into the seat. On the way around to the driver's side, I had just the faintest sensation of doubt, but I pushed it down deep inside. She seemed like the real Jenny to me, and that's all that mattered. Maybe we could finally be together after all. With the holiday season coming to an end, for many people it's understandable that money can be a little tight right now. Whatever it might be, monthly bills, groceries, gas, and so on, it can all pile up rather quickly and become an issue. Luckily, Dave can help get you out of a pinch so that you can enjoy time with family and friends and not worry so much. Now I'm sure you're wondering, who is Dave? But more like, what is Dave? Dave is the banking app that could help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. With Dave, there's no interest, late fees, or credit checks. How awesome is that? This allows you to have that extra money to take care of the things that need to be taken care of. And for your regular payments as well that you've been stressing out about, such as bills, groceries, and gas, you can finally tackle those as well. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to get the financial relief that they need with extra cash. So, if you're in a pinch and need some extra help, download Dave and think of it as a helping hand from future you. Download the Dave app from the App Store right now or go to dave.com. Sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking provided by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC.